everybody. Welcome to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. Is this our first one after a playoff game? I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hell so yeah. this is an exciting milestone. Hell yeah. Taylor is currently uh, at practice covering covering the team right now. We're recording on Wednesday, kind of a late night yesterday for especially for her, for yeah. all of us, for everyone who participated in that spectacle. Holy crap. Oh my goodness. Taylor will come on later whenever, whenever you guys record in the afternoon, but we need to, we just need to get this out there. We talked for maybe 30 seconds before we started recording, but Jenna and I both agreed could have quite possibly been the best game of hockey we have ever witnessed. That was just unreal. Had everything. I think you posted that in your story, but it really had it all. It was unbelievable. Oh my God. <laughs> it's just, it's one of those things that you really don't have the words because mm -hmm. I was, I was watching the game last night with uh, Rob Rossi from the athletic and we were both just kind of talking about like the game itself and all that. And afterwards I'm like, what is the storyline? Because there were, mm -hmm. it was everything. It was this game, honest to God, had everything because, I mean, just like you can break it down period by period. You can look mm -hmm. at what happened, but the Rangers come out flying, crazy intensity. They're, you know, 19 hits in the first period. Mm -hmm. They're going after people. The Ricard Raquel hit, which that can be a whole other discussion yeah. because of hopefully, um, like we said, Taylor's at practice too. So hopefully we'll get an update on him. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's nothing too, too serious. Yeah. Um, but then the second period, I mean, you, you watching the first period, it kind of felt how we thought the series may go coming into everything. That's kind yeah. of the, the way that I felt. I was like, okay, this is kind of what we expected here. The Rangers showing that, yeah, yeah. Hey, we are the better team. We're the more physical team. And then yeah. the Penguins came in in the second period. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Like that. The first period was very reminiscent of the past few playoff series the Penguins have been in. And I I was uh, with friends and watching the game. Just like I could feel myself like sinking into the couch, like not again. Lord have mercy. Why? Why is this happening to us again? And it was just from start to finish of that first period. Not good. The Penguins looked slower. They looked obviously less physical. They were getting knocked around specifically by Ryan Reeves, but it was like a switch flipped into that second period because yeah, holy hell, totally different team came out. And it was like, they went into the locker room and had the most intense regrouping session ever. And I don't know what was said, would love to have heard what was said, but man, they, they took charge of that game and took control and didn't really look back. They just kept, kept up with the Rangers and kept kind of driving and they th were crowding the net. They, it was like they had an aversion to the net in the first period. Like we don't want to go near that. What, what might happen? And they obviously didn't score, but th they just became so aggressive in the second period and really turned it around. It was, and that was where the fun began because, wow, like you said, storylines, which one? Where do you start? It was all gold. Amazing. And it was everything, everything that had been talked about leading into this series. Okay, the Penguins, yeah, they have the experience, but the Rangers, they're, you know, the bunch of kids that's faster, mm -hmm. stronger. They can outlast you. You know, they mm -hmm. don't care about experience. That was even said, I believe, in the – it was either the, it was the first period intermission when they talked with Adam mm. Fox. Um, and he had said, you know, we're kind of, we heard it and we're kind of like, okay, that's not us. Like, you know, yes, the Penguins have all this experience, but you know, we've been the better team mm. all year. And it was just like, I think the Rangers kind of, I don't want to say completely exhausted themselves after the first mm -hmm. period, but I think they came out too hard, too yep. quickly. And that plagued them because then again, the pens really settled in. 
I mean, again, we could talk about everything, but the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, one of the things coming in was that the stars were going to have to be the stars because the stars, yeah. as fantastic as they played at the end of the day in playoffs, it comes down to, are you scoring goals? Are mm-hmm. you going to be that guy that can find the back of the net? And that's been something that's played Jake Gensel a lot. I hate saying this in this way too, because it's Sidney Crosby. How can you criticize Sidney Crosby? Mm-hmm. He does so many things fantastic, but Sid right. hasn't been that goal scorer in the postseason the last handful that he has been. I mean, mm-hmm. this team as a whole has struggled the last three postseasons. Even I could say you could say go back to when they won a series and then lost to the Caps. Granted, the Caps right. eventually went on to win, but you needed that coming in. And for Jake Gensel to score the way he scored, the yep. way that top line played they were like when we talk about people like lines are buzzing that is the textbook definition the top line all night last night on or on tuesday when we're recording this on wednesday was Mm -hmm. buzzing unbelievable they just they had a fire under them that did not go out the entire game and you're so right because the rangers came out so hot they were they were laying hits all over the ice, up and down, flying, flying. And they got tired. They got really tired and they couldn't maintain that level of intensity throughout the game. The Penguins probably could have stood to start the game a little bit stronger than they did, but it was very evident that they knew what they were doing once they locked in and they played really smart. And Jake Gensel, just a really smart hockey player. He always seems to be exactly where he needs to be. And the chemistry between him and Sid just always blows my mind. I We watch it all the time. And it still, to me, is just like, how do we have these two guys playing together at the same time, it's just unbelievable. The passes that they they coordinate between each other and Sid just knows where Jake is going to be and he knows where to feed the puck. And, oh, those goals were tasty. And, he, like, even just kind of keeping in line with that, the Brian Rust goal, the feed to him, and he was he was just waiting for it. He, it, he knew that that puck was going to be there and – Talking again kind of about the inexperience, I'm assuming we're going to see the Rangers kind of tighten it up a little bit going into game two. But Igor Shosturkin, he was a big concern for a lot of people, myself included, because he's the Vezina front runner. He's been the, the most consistent and best goalie all year long. And he's young, though. Like, mm-hmm. he he really has not, you know, played any real game of consequence up until the game on Tuesday. And I think that he, he was really good in the regular season and nothing seemed to rattle him, but the playoffs are a totally different story. And I think that especially the Penguins just being in his face, like, that's the way that you beat goaltenders like that. You just have to crowd them get under their skin and then the goals just kind of come from that. Like you, you just see it happen a lot more. And I think that he was really in his own head a little bit. Um, Just the pens did a really good job of dismantling the Rangers from the top of the lineup to the bottom after that first period. It was incredible to see, Oh my God, this game, this game. Ah, and the questions was just Sturkin. I mean, that's such a good point, too, because his only playoff experience was in the bubble. So he gets yep. a tiny bit of exposure there. And again, you know, they got swept in the bubble by Carolina, mm-hmm. I believe. Um, yeah, I but think you're right. This was going to be, you know, that big question. How is he going to do in his first true postseason? And if you're the Penguins, I mean, I know that we're going to talk about goalies for God knows how long at this point. But yeah. um, if you're the Penguins, you have to like that was one of the biggest things is, is when they scored that first goal and they were so close to getting that second goal. You mm-hmm. obviously felt the momentum shift, but it was going to be how does Shesterkin respond yep. to this and 
for Penguins fans, they have to be thrilled because this is the best Mm -hmm. that you've looked against him all year long when you faced him. So again, that's how you get in these guys' heads because we talk Mm -hmm. about goaltenders getting hot and, you know, being that force of nature that can win their team series in the ways that they do, or, you know, Mm -hmm. score a game here and there. This is kind of the formula for the Penguins. And it was, I was intrigued because again, the first period was a little bit of, okay, we're not getting to him as much. He's looking really good. He's looking really sharp. And I mean, obviously having 70, was it 72, 79 saves? I forget the number exactly he finished with. Like for him, he had a phenomenal performance, but to Mm -hmm. lose that game, the mental impact, I think that is also going to Mm -hmm. do a whole lot for this Rangers team that again, benefits the Penguins. And also they snapped their streak of losing in overtime in the first game. Yes, we did it. Oh my goodness. That was huge. And you know, you talk about mental, the mental piece of this, like so many things that have to have the Penguins feeling really good going into game two, because yeah, they snapped that overtime streak in the first game. I mean, when was the last time that they won the first game of a playoff series? Was that in 2018? Like, it was, I think it was the, yeah, the 17, 18 play. But yeah. I don't remember. I, Cause they, the last, so when they played the Islanders, the two times in Montreal mm-hmm. in the middle, they've lost yep. all of those games because all yep. of them went to overtime and they lost yep. all of them. So, yep. and the little mental part of things and yep. we would of course be remiss without talking about, again, we're going to wait for updates from Taylor mm-hmm. on Casey to Smith, but yeah. I mean, unbelievable what? performance from him. The best yeah. thing you could possibly ask for. And again, giving up three goals, I think looking at the types of goals they were, I, I wouldn't put, I, don't, I wouldn't even put, mm. I mean, they were good shots. They were a power play goal from Adam Fox, the shorthanded kind of can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the second goal when I forget who it was came right up the middle. Like those are just types of yeah. things that like as a goaltender, I don't put the blame on him mm-hmm. entirely. So, I mean, he played, a fantastic game. And that's yeah. not even the storyline because then Louis Domingue comes in. Like there's just, I, I'm sorry for right. getting loud. There's so oh much. Oh my goodness. But there is so much. There's so yeah. much. And like, talk about a question mark around a goalie situation. Like everybody was kind of like, Oh, Casey to Smith. We don't, we don't know. And then if, if he's not good, then Louis Domingue and we don't know. It was just all of this. And you're right. Casey had a fantastic game. Like yeah. at, Igor Shosturkin let in four goals. So, like, if you're if you want to look at that, like he he played really well and he kept up toe to toe with Shosturkin. So, fantastic job by him. But what the hell, Louis Deming coming in in relief in the middle of double overtime after he had just admittedly eaten spicy pork and broccoli. I love it so much. It is like what legends are made of. I'm here for it. I can't wait for the shirts that are made because of this, but he, he did not look rattled, phased anything. He, he looked like he was, he's been a starting goaltender for a contending team for years. Like he was just so calm and collected and played incredibly well to help yep. the Penguins secure the win. That was un- that was just unreal. Like it, how? And oh, all in one game. You you couldn't have like if this was a movie, I don't think you could have scripted it any better. <laughs> just the way everything happened leading into this. Again, there are so many storylines. It was just mm-hmm. all of it wrapped into one was kind of just phenomenal. But for Deming to come in the way that he did, and he even said after the game too, you know, getting that first save like in your belly, that's exactly what you want. Mm-hmm. And that was, as soon as I saw that first shot and him kind of collected the way he did, I'm like, oh, that's going to settle him in perfectly mm-hmm. as goalies. You always want that. But the mental feat of coming in completely cold. He said after mm-hmm. the game, he thought they were kidding. Like <laughs> he thought they were joking when they're like, no, you have to go in because De Smith skates over to the bench in the stoppage. And I'm looking, I'm like, Oh, does he have an equipment issue? Is it something mm-hmm. with his glove? Is it something with his skate? And then all of a sudden it just like, you see Domingue get on the ice. I'm like, what mm-hmm. is happening right now? Yep. Craziness. Oh, it, oh. it felt like kind of, a bit of a circus because I, I was driving home whenever Casey DeSmith got hurt and 
Josh gets off and Phil Bork were like, Oh, it, they thought it was an equipment issue too. And then they were like, wait a minute. Uh, nope. He's going down the tunnel. And I was like, Oh no, Oh no. Oh no. And then they said that Louis Domingue was coming onto the ice and I was like, Oh no. Oh Lord have mercy. What is going on? Yeah. yeah. But like you expect if you make it all the way to double overtime and you haven't had to step skate on the ice, like, you're probably golden. You yeah. can just chill and watch and enjoy from the bench, but nope. He he went in and he nothing about him looked cold. He no. he looked like he had been, you know, skating laps in the back by himself. It just so ready to roll. Unbelievable. That was and again, I just like I c- cannot believe how well he played. It just yeah. Huh. And it wasn't like he made, you know, four or five saves. It's 17 saves. A lot. You know, they, they were, and there were a couple of those chances where you were like, a Ranger would get on a, a Ranger player would get it on his stick. And you're just like, uh, like you mm-hmm. hold your breath a little bit because you're mm-hmm. like, what's going to happen here? But I mean, just the way all of that. And then of course, Malkin, we talked okay. about all the stars, but the way mm. that he played, again, this is mm. what you need. You need playoff Crosby, playoff Malkin, playoff yeah. Gensel. And they came out. They mm-hmm. delivered last night a two-point night for Malkin, the assi- the, his assist to Rust, and then mm-hmm. the goal, the way in which he scored. Mm. Just, I mean, for him to, that has to just do so much just with, yeah. again, all the, I don't even want to say ups and downs, just but with all the, the roller coaster of the mm-hmm. season for him in terms of yeah. injury and what, you know, last postseason was. Again, little monkeys that these guys are getting all off their backs. And I mm-hmm. think that kind of in turn turns to the whole team getting a decent amount of the monkeys off their back. And I think this gives Penguins fans a whole lot of hope to ride on. Even if the series goes completely downhill from here, Mm -hmm. I think this game itself was like, okay, this is what this team is capable of. They proved it not only to themselves, which they clearly knew, but to everybody Mm -hmm. else that like, Hey, you might think like we're dead and, you know, dead on arrival and that the Rangers are just going to sweep us in forward. And they're like, Mm -hmm. yeah, not so quick. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it really did kind of, give back some belief in the team to the fans and the people watching, because obviously there, there was so much chatter around this team from the start. We mention all the time or not all the time. That's a bit dramatic, but we do bring up a lot how all of us kind of thought maybe before the season started, this might be the time that the penguins finally miss the playoffs. We just weren't sure with all the injuries and with everything going on and the aging stars and Who's it going to be in goal? Are they going to be good enough? And the fact that they did what they did last night, regardless of how the series goes, regardless of how the postseason goes, right now, it at least gave some hope to people that, all right, at least at least we have ourselves a series because I was expecting this to kind of be like uh, painful to watch, but that was so much fun. And if... I don't want every game to go to triple overtime. If they could win in regulation, that would be ideal. But if every game can have that level of energy, sign me up. Don't, yep, yep, I'm here for it because that was amazing. So good. And again, things that we just didn't touch on because, you know, naturally this game had everything. The fact that they almost lost in regulation and the video team and Mike Sullivan challenging for goaltender interference. Does anybody actually know what goaltender interference is? Because that's a no. But I mean, I I don't know if that's just one of those, you know, the hockey gods clearly on their side, the Penguins video team. I mean, we did it. We talked about it last week. I feel like we talk about it every week. Shouts to them. They're perfect Mm -hmm. on challenges this season. They're either eight for eight or nine for nine. I forget. Eight for eight. Yeah. Eight for just, I mean, like them, you know, seeing that. I mean, you had to challenge that anyway in that spot. But the fact Mm -hmm. that. You know, you felt almost, okay, Dumoulin might have pushed him in and it might have yeah. been that. And then for them to say no goal, still tied 3-3, three, three, that that That's moment huge. was, uh, again, there were so many turning points in this game. Mm-hmm. It turned one way and then it turned back the other way and then it turned again and then it turned around. And uh, uh, <laughs> the, the drama, I am here for the drama. Amazing. Oh, my God. All of the drama. Love it. Love it. And we're hoping it continues. We're hoping 
just I, I know Penguins fans want a little bit of like, can we just do it in regulation? <laughs> can we, like you said, we need that in regulation. So I know all of, all of our uh, all of our reporter friends that are in New York City as well as Taylor. Yeah. You know, we uh, we give them yeah. a heck of a lot of credit for their you know mm-hmm. three a.m., four a.m., six a.m. nights uh, last night. But yeah, hopefully they can get some sleep. Hopefully, yeah, and hopefully the game tonight, Thursday, will be just as good. We're going to take a quick break. Whenever we come back, Taylor will be with Jenna, and they'll break down hopefully some injury updates, some things to look forward to in the game on Thursday, and some other good stuff from game one. Welcome back to Podcast on Fifth Ave. As you can see, Taylor has joined us. Welcome back from practice and uh, glad you got a little bit of sleep, Taylor, considering it was very needed. Uh, after that triple overtime thriller that Jordan and I had way too much fun talking about. Yeah, I, I did not get much sleep, honestly, but I that was crazy. I You know, when it gets that late, you know, it's getting into the territory where I'm like, maybe we'll cancel practice tomorrow and we can sleep mm-hmm. in. That didn't happen. Nope. Honestly, very surprised with a number of guys who, so they made the practice optional, mm-hmm. very surprised with a number of guys who still participated. It was ma- at least like half the team. And, you know, you expected the scratches to be out there, but like Jeff Carter's out there, Brian Boyle, um, Crosby's out there. And like, I mean, Brian Boyle, Jeff Carter, two, what, two, the 37 club. Um, I'm very surprised to see them back out there. Crosby out there, I guess not that surprised. But it was a very uh, light practice, um, optional, just, you know, a lot of skills work with, with Ty Hennis and um, guys having fun. There was an emergency backup uh, participating. Love the knee bug. We love it. Yeah, it was uh, – so, like, Louis Domingue did, did um, practice the, the – the e-bug was uh, Reed Robertson, who is the New York e-bug. So, you know, if there's ever a situation in a game here with the Rangers or the visiting team where there is, you know, an emergency backup that needs to go in, Reed Robertson is the guy. Um, he played at D3 Manhattanville College. Like, uh, younger guy. Honestly, there's, like, nothing out, out there on this guy. I see he's six foot six, 220, and he uh, was also on the golf team. So, But hopefully it won't come to that. No, hopefully it will not. You do have some updates from practice. I know yeah. Jordan and I uh, eagerly tease those because everybody's wondering what the heck is going on with the goalies, especially considering – we, you know, everybody had kind of bargained with themselves. Okay, we're going to be without Tristan Jari for a little bit here. This team is going to rely on Casey DeSmith heavily, who played a phenomenal game on Tuesday night and then obviously exited. So what did uh, what did Sully have to say um, about his status and Richard Raquel, too? I know everybody was concerned about after him after that hit. Yeah, so uh, DeSmith day-to-day with a lower body injury, Raquel day-to-day. still. Both of them are still being evaluated. Um, and other updates, uh, Jari still has not skated yet. Um, Zucker has skated with the team these last two days in the optional um, skate and in the optional practice. Um, Jari is continuing his rehab off the ice. Zucker still day-to-day. Um, so basically everyone's day to day, uh, but Jari is on this trip, which I think is at least in, encouraging. Yeah. I did see him in, cause I mean, we hadn't even seen him, you know, we're not in the locker rooms. We're not we're walking by those areas. We're not seeing these guys, um, if they're not on the ice, but Jari was in the press box. Um, uh, wasn't using crutches or anything like that. I'm like, look, you know, he's like maybe like 10 seats down. I'm like, is he wearing a boot? Like, I, I couldn't tell. Uh, like, I'm, like, I'm like trying to, his like feet are under the desk and I'm like looking and like, and like I, I can't see his feet. I like get up and like, I, I do a walk by like to get water. And then I'm like checking. I'm like, okay, no boot. Um, so I mean, the jar- important sleuthing we need, we need. Yeah. <laughs> to see Jari's feet. But um, yeah, no boot, uh, which I very encouraging, but again, he hasn't even been on the ice yet. So don't know when we're going to see him again, but, uh, yeah, DeSmith day to day. So they did recall, um, Alex Dorio. So they do have a backup. They're not going to have to use the D3 college kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> Alex Dorio, he came up from Wilkes-Barre. He is quite literally the only option. 
um, who is under contract and healthy. They have two healthy goalies in Wilkes-Barre. It was Dorio and Tommy Napier. Tommy Napier is on an AHL contract. They did have another NHL contact contracted goalie in um, Philip Lindbergh. Philip Lindbergh's uh, been injured since November, so he's out. Alex Dorio is the guy. Um, we've talked about him, I think, on on the show before. When we when we had Derek Army on, um, you know, Dorio he he took over as Wilkes-Barre's starter last season towards this, you know, the, in the second half. Really great year. Um, coming into this season, he had an ear infection in um, coming out of in camp and then coming out of camp, he got the flu. Oh. Um, it just a bunch of things kept, you know, he had like bumps and bruises. He played, you know, some like seven games in Wheeling, got healthy, got called up, you know, up to Wilkes-Barre, got COVID. And it was like symptomatic COVID where he was out for, you know, a little over two weeks. Uh. So he's, he's had the worst luck, but he's, you know, shown great potential at times. Um, again, you're hoping you won't have to see him in a game because, you know, you because you hope nothing happens to Louis. Um, but yeah, it's looking like it's Louis's net um, here on. So I, I was calling him Mr. Game One. I because I mean it was before you know you you were around covering the team, but um, Zatkoff had to start Game One in in 2016. Yeah. Um, he was the third goalie, and and he earned the nickname Mr. Game One because he won. Um, and that's the only game he played. But Louis um, he's probably gonna play beyond Game One. So. He's the guy. And it's just one of those, like, I don't think anybody could have imagined this. Like, the whole conversation, not even leading up to this playoffs, but, like, starting, I think, as soon as they were eliminated by the Islanders last year is, okay, well, when they get to the playoffs next year, how is Jari going to perform? What's Jari going to do? Then it was, okay, Jari's out. Now how is Smith going to rise to the occasion? You know, he had a shaky start. And now it's just like, I, I, I no one could have imagined this. And honestly, this is one of those things that, like, I feel like the team is just, you absolutely get behind. I mean, the performance he had Tuesday night, beyond incredible, but just to, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of momentum there that they can ride on. For sure. Yeah, he he was not expecting to go in either. I mean, um, he did say, you know, what, you know, after a certain point, you know, you become like a fan because he, he was sitting there for four hours in his gear, four, four hours be- before he came in in the second overtime. Um, he said at some point you, 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 you know, become like a fan. And I did put a note in our live file, you know, before he, he came in, um, where, cause your MSG, the bench is short. Mm-hmm. Um, so the backup goalies, they don't sit on the bench. They sit in the tunnel, um, over in the corner of the ice. So where, you know, in the press box, I can see him. And, and I, I just thought it was funny that like, you know, whenever the range, so whenever there's a good opportunity at that end of the rink, he's like jumping out of his seat and like, he's, he's really into it. He's watch, he's down there with Mark Friedman. It was him and Mark Friedman in, in the tunnel watching the game together. Um, and he's getting real into it. I just thought it was funny, you know, and then, uh, the big thing with the, I don't know if you and Jordan talked about it, but the spicy pork and broccoli, I feel like that was the story. Very briefly touched on that because we were saying that I can't wait for those t-shirts. Honest to God. I mean, this is, it's just phenomenal in every single way. I mean, he was just like straight up. Like, yeah. yeah, probably wasn't the best, but like, I mean, get behind yeah. it. You got to stay with it now, Louie. Yeah, it, it was it was the the post game meal that they had for the team to eat afterwards, and you know between intermissions, you know guys are eating like fruit, you know bananas, apples, stuff like that, um, just to get some energy and you know to eat something. But I mean Louis, who had been sitting on the bench, you know it, he ate it between the first and second intermissions. You know he's like I'm not going in, so he eats the post game meal early, spicy pork and broccoli. His agent Alan Walsh posted a picture of it. Honestly, it didn't look good. Uh, that, <laughs> it, it look- that picture did not look appetizing. <laughs> so um I did think it was funny you know um he said you know two of the officials in the game um are you know French Canadian guys and he actually knew them pretty well and he said you know because he is in the corner he's not on the bench and I you know when there's that stoppage um and the Smith is going over to the bench you see like Louis craning his neck he can't see the bench where he is so he's like he's like trying to he's like what's happening and then the two officials go up to him and he said you know they tell him like hey you're going in and Louis said you know he thought they were screwing with him just because you know they, they knew each other well um it's just so funny but um because again like nothing visible happened to the Smith no. it's not like he got run into or it was you know they stopped the play for him to to get off um, I thought maybe initially 
it looked like he was looking at his hand on the bench. I guess that's not the case because Sullivan did say lower body, but he was like he was limping off. Yeah. Um, it, it didn't look good. So, uh, I mean, Louis comes in. <laughs> I asked Malkin after the game about Louis, and he's like, "For me, I know Louis is unbelievable." He said, "You know, he's big, he's fast, and and it's hard to score on him in practice." So he was like. Uh, you know, Louis comes in, he makes a couple saves right away. He's like, we were fine. We, we, we weren't nervous. So, uh, yeah, the team really um, it seems like they have a lot of confidence in Louis. And the drop-off from Jari to the Smith, pretty steep. That's one that it's like, okay, they're going to have to, you know, get past this. The drop-off from the Smith to Deming, not that big. No. So it, it's not that, you know, you'd like to have the Smith healthy too, but it's not that big of a change here. No. And it's just, it, it was, it was all of it. I think just still kind of feels surreal in a sense, just the way that everything happened. And that was something that Jordan and I talked about, but just like, there were so many storylines in this where it's like, okay, you look at the first period and you look at them getting, you know, body out bodied and out chanced. And, you know, you thought, okay, this was, here we go again. And then it was the second period and then it was the star scoring. And then it was DeSmith playing a great game. And then it was Deming coming. I mean, you, you could just go on and on and on about everything. The, um, the goalie interference call in the, in the third, I mean, challenging that pretty risky at the time because you know so they're they're now down one goal mm -hmm. they challenge that it seems like you know the different angles because again when they're looking at this on the bench they don't have a great view of it the coaches you know they're watching there's like a little screen below them but it's through glass it's foggy they can't see it that well they're really relying on those uh on those andy so sure um the goal you know the video coaches and if if they weren't you know, completely confident in that. There's like three minutes left in the game. Um, if they get it wrong, they're going on the on the PK. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's that's a penalty for a failed coach's challenge. If they're down one goal, they'd be on the PK. That would that would have been the game. Um, so if if that doesn't go their way, I mean, that's that's huge too. But yeah, there's there's just so many things. Like we could do like a couple hours just on this game talking about it. It is crazy. We're gonna take a quick break and then we will talk a little bit more because Taylor, obviously you were there, you had just the perspective. I want a little more of, you know, what the environment felt like and uh, all that. So we'll take a quick break uh, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to podcast on Fifth Ave. We're just going to keep this rolling and talking about what a game that was on Tuesday. Taylor, because Madison Square Garden is in itself one of the best arenas in all of sports. It's so historic. Everybody says it's some of their favorite places to play. The players that we talk to, we hear from them. What was the atmosphere like? Because this is a town or a city, obviously, that hasn't had playoff hockey in a handful of years and then for everything to happen the way that it happened. Yeah. I mean, right off the bat, it, it incredibly loud and you know, you expected that um, they're into, I mean, chanting for much of the first, I mean, it, when, when it seemed like the Rangers are going to kind of wipe, you know, the floor of the penguins in this series. And um, yeah. And the, the penguins, they kept, you know, quieted, quieted them down for, for the rest of the game. Um Every, you know, every, the Jake Ansel's first goal and a second goal, it did kind of, you know, quiet them down a little bit, but then, you know, they came back. But um, when that goal they scored to go ahead, they came back, they, the Heedle goal, when that came back from that, you know, just zapped the energy out of the place. Um, and, and it incredibly quiet. I, I didn't stick around to see what happened, you know, when the overtime goal scored because you got to book it out of there in that press box. It's You have to look like mazes to get down to like the press room. But, um, yeah, I Shesterkin, um I mean every big save he was making, they're chanting Igor. They're behind him. Um I thought one of the funniest things was uh there was like I, I couldn't even tell you which period. It was towards the end, you know, it all runs together, but um there was like a missed icing call that you know would have better benefited the Rangers. And then from then on, every time they did call icing on the penguins, the crowd was going wild it was like that was like that was like what got the crowd back into it kind of like well you know when the penguins started getting back it was like rallying around um missed icing calls there was one moment where um 
they're chanting like asshole at the ref. I don't know if we're allowed to say that on the podcast. I don't know what the language guidelines are, but um, it's fine. But they're chanting that. And, like the official, like he, one of them tripped and fell down and like they're chanting that at him too. But um, just kind of energy that, yeah, like you don't, you know, you don't see that in every road building, even for um, the playoffs. Uh, I mean, like PPG, it's not, it's not that loud. Um, not that many like can organize chants, but um, definitely crazy atmosphere. Uh, and you know, the Penguins quieted them at the end. I mean, just the way, the fact that they were able to get a win on the road, I think is so crucial, especially to take game one in the way that they took it. And Jordan and I talked about this, but the fact that overtime losses, the last three playoffs has plagued this team so desperately, you almost felt a little bit like, oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> that, that, at least that for me, that's what, you know, in the couple of years I've been covering this team because we had the Islanders last year, then the bubble the year before with Montreal. And then I wasn't here for this, but the year before with the Islanders, it just felt almost like, oh, we've been here before. We know how this story ends. Well, yeah. I mean, especially because, I mean, it wasn't, you know, the last playoff game the Penguins played, but, you know, game five against against the Islanders, that, you know, double overtime loss, once it gets into like double overtime here in this game, you know, people are saying like, okay, like, no, no, no passes up the middle, like from the goalie, <laughs> just like <laughs> praise the puck because yeah, you are getting kind of like deja vu, but I mean, so huge for in so many ways, again, you know, to get that overtime win, um, to kind of set the tone because the last three games against the Rangers were really not going in the Penguins way. The only, like, we talked about at length, you know, Brian Boyle had the only even strength goal in the whole regular season series against the the Rangers. It, it looked like a heavily, you know, um, the Penguins were the, the heavy underdog coming into this. And then um, the importance of winning like game one, historically, um, that team does go on to win the series more often than not. I, I did just pull up the numbers. Um, Teams that open a playoff series with a win have gone on to win the series 68.6% of the time. And it, it, it's very important to do that when you are the lower seed, when you are the team opening on the road. Because yeah. when it's the home team that wins the opening game, that number rises to 75.1% uh, success rate of closing out um, and advancing to the second round. And when it's the away team that wins game one, they drop the home team's chances of moving uh, moving on down to 42.4%. So um, just the importance of doing that with the Penguins being the lower seed in this series. Because um, you really do kind of take away the home, home ice advantage for the Rangers with that win. So um, yeah. you split, you know, this series, if they can win the, the, you know, the games in Pittsburgh, you know, it's, they have a good chance of making it out of this. Which I think is just so intriguing because, again, we've been talking at length about how the Rangers just came into this one seeming like the heavy favorites, just based on what the regular season th those matchups were like. But you kind of have to – you take the regular season with a little bit of grain of salt, but you do have to throw a little bit away because, again, anything can happen. And I think what was so – fascinating, I guess, about all of this was like the Penguins quelled all of the storylines, like the storylines coming in. Well, how is Casey DeSmith going to play? DeSmith went out and had himself a phenomenal game. Will the stars perform the way that they have? He went out and played well. Oh, the Penguins have all this experience, but the Rangers have this youth, have this speed, have this tenacity. Um, and Jordan and I talked about this, but, you know, the uh, first period intermission, the Adam Fo interview that Adam Fox had with Emily Kaplan, she asked him about, you know, there's so much narrative surrounding, you know, the Penguins team with experience and you guys not with any. And here you are with a one goal lead. And he was like, yeah, you know, we didn't really we heard it, but we're not listening to it. And it was just one of those like, mm, interesting. And I think I, I mean, one of the biggest things for me, too, was Shesterkin and the question marks of how he was going to perform. Because again, he's been so phenomenal. He should absolutely win the Vesna. He was fantastic during the regular season, but this was his first true test of postseason hockey. And I think mentally for him, this changes a lot. And I mean, you can look at it on both sides because I mean, a ridiculous number of saves. That was a hell of a performance and then some, but to do that and lose, I think has to like get in there a little bit. Yeah, because what did he finish with? Like seventy saves, some over seventy. 
I keep saying 72 or 79. I think it was 72. So yeah, something, something like that. It, in, insane. I mean, yeah, they got four past him. Um, <laughs> when, when you figure in the amount of shots they were putting on him, you know, he, he still had a pretty good game, but you know, they, the Penguins, you know, they realize he's not unbeatable. Like he was mm-hmm. when he shut him out in the last game. Um, yeah. So, so that was huge. And I mean, to put that kind of workload on him, uh, you have to wonder like how maybe that affects the goalie, you know, coming into you know can you wear him down coming into game two I don't I'm not sure um not many goalies make 70 saves I don't know there's a precedent I I think there's a lot of lingering things that can go over to game two too obviously because Domingue is a huge storyline how is he gonna look how is he gonna perform Shesterkin how is he gonna bounce back how is he gonna respond I think one of the most intriguing things too is how is this Rangers team going to adjust because did they kind of, I was watching, I told Jordan this, I was watching the game with Rob Rossi on Tuesday night and it felt like the Rangers almost like outgassed themselves too early, just with the aggressiveness and the, you know, the way that they came after the pens in that first period, I think maybe set them back a little bit. Yeah. Seemingly all directed at like their defensemen, like John Marino and Shadow oh. Ruedel, especially, it seems like they were taking a beating. Oh. Um but, uh, yeah, I mean, but we really only saw that, you know, in early in the game, and it really wasn't that much of a factor as the game went on. And I think, like you said, you know, they were tiring themselves out. So um, the Penguins, they were able to withstand that. I mean, you, they did lose Raquel. So you wouldn't – You'd. I don't know what kind of response you get. I feel like we're going to have to – like Brian Boyle is going to have to fight Ryan Reeves at some point oh. just because he's the only guy who can. Okay. Um I don't know. Let's say dress Mark Friedman. I you know it's not going to happen. But I don't think I don't think we're going to see Mark Friedman. But you know Mark Friedman would be going after Ryan Reeves. Um, Honestly, as much of a bad idea as it would be for him, he would be doing it. It, um, it would. I feel like it would bode too well. It would be shades of Pat Maroon all over again. It would. Um, yeah, but yeah, the physicality. Honestly, I think yeah, this game does really uh, set. It sets the tone well for you know. I know you guys talk about like you know the the core and the stars and the and the top line and moving forward. But you know, like they did not have a, a lot of success the past couple of postseasons. Jake Gensel, especially, you know, his first two playoffs in the league very strong and then the last three he had one goal in each of those um and then he he doubled that uh in, with the, his two goals last night so um get your jake shakes uh well i guess you know not to you're gonna be listening to this late maybe if he gets another yeah. um he does have a baby on the way so he has a family to support Ooh, that's right. Big news in a week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, baby boy due uh, early August. Can you imagine if his baby is born on August 7th? I don't know if Sip would love that or be like weird about it. Like, no, that's my day. <laughs> <laughs> Only I can have an August 7th birthday. Honestly, but, um, we need it like August 8th, just to, like just in perfect fashion. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's another potential baby in a cup, if there is a cup. Um, Ricard Raquel, his uh, his wife is the other um, pregnant one. Um, she's due in like a month um, or like the end of June, maybe. Um, I did think it was very interesting. You know, his his wife had she's she does like in she's like an influencer kind of on Instagram. She posts um, a lot of cool stuff. But so I follow her, and she posted a picture. Marcus Pedersen and his girlfriend ship them like a gift for the baby and it's um you know like baby clothes and like toys but it's all like penguin stuff like peng- oh. penguins onesies you know penguins you know little baby toys but uh I mean Raquel's a free agent I feel like Pedersen's working under the assumption that Raquel's gonna be back <laughs> so like we know we want to be and he's gonna he's, he has a lot the they're having a girl so their baby girl has a lot of uh you know clothes to wear if she does get put into the Stanley Cup so honestly I there's so many reasons that it would be great for this team to win a cup but the baby in the cup just I mean come on we need it <laughs> great timing great timing for yeah, him and, and Gensel you know I went back and I looked Gensel at, at the all-star game he was asked kind of about, you know, just the families and all and how he was, like, looking forward to maybe, like, having, like, one of his own, uh, like, a family and, like, kids, you know, himself, you know, at the All-Star game one day. And, like, I, at, at the time, she would have been, like, two months pregnant. So, like, he, he, he knew this. But mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh, that's, you know, that's, that's far off because I feel like Gensel's still, like, 15. He's not. Um, 
crazy to me. I, I still feel like he's like a like a seventeen year old kid. Yeah, he's not. But uh, <laughs> baby on the way. So get your Jake shakes. He has a he has a family to support. Family to support. Um, I want to say one final thing before we go. Can we, I don't know if you could hear it the way that we could hear it on the broadcast because ESPN's mics pick it up well. Jake Gensel's woo after he scores is unlike anything I've ever heard. I need that on like a loop. Okay, no, so no, but I I did. You know, whenever they do the post game a helmet when they hand it off, he he's definitely the one making like weird noise. I think he does that when they give the helmet away or like when the guy makes a speech in the locker room. I you know I, I've been trying to figure out who it is. I think it's him. Um, there's that, and then do you remember? I can't remember if we talked about it on here. They posted like a a, so- a pregame soccer video for one game, and guys are meowing at each other. Yes. Um, I'm like 90% sure that's Cabinet and Latang because like if you look at like their Instagram stories, you know, they re- repost, you know, on their stories stuff, the other one posts and like they'll capture it with like meow. So I think Latang and Captain and meow at each other. I don't know why. That's such like a weird relationship, like a pairing. Just because like Latang is like an older guy, Captain's a younger Finnish kid. Like I don't know what drew them together, but yeah, they. Or why they're meowing at each other. What a weird thing. But we did that start. We need to get to the bot- bottom of that. We need to get to the bottom of that. And we need to get to the bottom of will Louis Domingue have spicy pork and broccoli leading into game two. He Potential. has to. Oh my God. With Crosby superstitions, like you, you better believe like when Crosby heard about that, he like he pulled Louis aside and was like, Hey, you're gonna you're gonna have to eat that spicy pork and broccoli. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you didn't like it, but yeah, sorry if it made your stomach turn. I I laughed so hard. One of the moms um, I go to the gym with was like so excited about this game. And she was talking to me on Wednesday um, and our trainer came up and kind of came into the conversation and she was telling her about the spicy broccoli and pork. And she goes, he had that in between a game? Like it, before he played? She was floored. I couldn't imagine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> could, not, could not fathom. But hey, whatever works, keep the momentum going. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Louis Deming, spicy pork and broccoli. That should be one of the storylines from this playoffs, and I love it. <laughs> it has to be. Honestly, again, we need the t-shirts. We need them. It'll. They will come. It yeah, will happen. Absolutely. Uh, well, we are gonna call it a wrap for this episode. I feel like this has been so fun. They all are, but it's just it's fun to talk about playoff hockey. It's fun to talk about playoff hockey when the Penguins are winning. Hopefully they keep this on a roll and we'll be really intrigued to kind of see the next time we talk because at least two games, three more games will have passed. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're right. What day is it? I don't even know. (laughs) Taylor, go get some sleep. Um, Thank you so much for joining us from New York. Thank you all listeners, viewers for joining us as well. You can subscribe, listen, uh, Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcasts. Leave us uh, some five-star reviews. We really enjoy those. And we will see you next week and have a whole lot more to talk about.